Professor Terence Tao from the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA, who will um, talk to us about uh, recent developments in the prime, prime number theory in the 21st century. And Terry, thank you. Of course. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be back in Poland. I've always enjoyed my previous visits here. And uh, also to be virtually um, in Ukraine, I very much hope one day to, to be there in person. Uh, I think this is a great uh, program, a great initiative, and I hope there'll be more events like this. Um, yeah, so my lectures, uh, so first of all, my lectures are, I, I sent in my notes uh, a few days ago, so they should be available on the conference webpage, I believe. Um, so I'll be following my notes. Um, I'll be speaking about various um, developments in number theory, in, I think number theory in the last 20 years, maybe uh, 10, 15 years. Um, not a few that are a bit more recent, but uh, but uh, um, but all sort of in the 21st century. Um, I know the audience has sort of various uh, a, a wide degree of background, um, and not all of you may be familiar with sort of the basics of analytic number theory. So I've kind of had to find some sort of middle ground where I'll be mostly talking about fairly basic stuff in analytic number theory and then sketching the proof of more recent results. But I, there's no way in the time I have to be able to present in detail um, um, the full proofs of, of any of, of the uh, most recent results. But hopefully these lectures can give you enough of a start that maybe then you can read some other uh, more advanced material to, uh, um, um, to find out more. Okay, so my first two lectures are about prime gaps. So uh, you can let P n denote the nth prime number. Okay, so P1 is 2, 2 is 3, and so forth. Um, and then you can talk about prime gaps, which is just the difference between two consecutive primes. <laughs> And so the uh, basic question is sort of how big and how small um, can these gaps get? And the simple question once you study the primes at all. Um, and it's so amazing that actually uh, uh, we don't actually know. Uh, I mean, there's so many questions about, uh, about just uh, this simple concept are, um, are still open. Um, so our primes, you know, this is sort of an, an additive question about primes. You're, 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 in order to subtract two primes, you need to understand the additive structure of primes. And we still really don't understand <coughs> the structure of primes anywhere near as much as we'd like to. The multiplicative structure of the primes runs in very well, but the additive structure is, is, is very, still very limited understanding as, as evidenced by sort of how little we know about, about this question. But we have made progress. Okay. So what can we say about prime gaps? Okay. So, so first of all, um, all primes other than the first one are odd. So P is odd. And because of N1, so clearly the prime gaps are all, must be even for N at least two. Okay, so uh, we have a, a lower bound. Okay. Uh, what are upper bounds? Well, uh, one basic fact about primes is Bertrand's postulate. It's a funny name because it's, it's, it's a theorem, um, and it's actually not, not so hard to prove. Okay, so uh, there exists a prime in any interval between x, x and 2x for all x bigger than 2. Every, every interval from x to 2x contains at least one prime. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, that means um, uh, it's, it's not hard to conclude actually from this that, that this f plus first prime is at most twice the nth prime. And so you also get. Now we're going like this. Okay, so um, uh, you can, there's a sort of an easy lower and upper bound on um, on these prime gaps, and the question is, you know, how much better can you do? Okay, can you do that? Okay, and in in, in this lecture, I will talk mostly about sort of small prime gaps. How small can you can you make um, the um, uh, these prime gaps? And then in in the second lecture, about how large you can make these prime gaps. All right, so um, in analytic number theory, uh, we can prove relatively little. Um, a lot of easy questions about primes, we, can, we don't know, we can't prove or disprove. 
um, uh, what we um, our conjectures, but we have um, uh, an excellent uh, sort of heuristic model. We, we understand uh, sort of what uh, we have a very good um, um, heuristic understanding of the primes, and we sort of we sort of know what the conjecture is true and what's false. You can't prove most of most of that. Um, so there is a famous conjecture in this area, which you should already know. It's called the confined conjecture. So the prime gaps, um, so the, the, there are at least two, they're usually bigger than two, but, but, very, but uh, the, the, the term conjecture is the statement that the prime gap should actually equal to infinitely often. Our three bits I O. Okay, so there are instantly many prime gaps that are equal to two. Okay, so uh, when that occurs, these primes are called twin primes. Um, so that's not known because numerically we can find you know a couple of million twin primes, but that doesn't tell us uh, that there is an infinite number. Um, we know there's infinite many primes, and we have um, asymptotics for how many primes there are, but but they don't translate directly to enough information about prime gaps here. So this is um, is open. Um, it's a special case of what's called a De Polynex conjecture. Okay, that's that for any even number h, okay, the prime gap should actually equal h in the author. So not only do you have primes which are gap of two, there should also be infinite many primes which are gap of four, six, and so forth. That's, that's also open. Um, he made that in the 19, uh, 1840s or so, I think. Um, now, so th these are open, um, and there's a good reason why they're, they're open, actually. Um, there's, uh, there's an obstruction. So um, um, the strongest results we have towards these conjectures uses um, a, a technique called sieve theory, which we'll talk about later. Um, but we know that all sieve theoretic uh, methods are um, constrained by something called a parity problem. Um, and this parity problem prevents sieve theory methods from proving results like this. Uh, you can get close to these results in some sense, but you can't, you can't uh, prove things like this directly. Um, and so in order to ever prove these, these, uh, um, these sort of conjectures, we need um, some non-trivial input that is not sieve theoretic. Um, and we don't have that uh, in the images. Um, there are function computer analogs where there are some algebraic inputs that, that you, can, you can add and you, you can get some, <laughs> but, um, uh, but not in the images. <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, we are convinced these conjectures are true. Uh, we, we, have, we have very good uh, heuristic reasons to, to expect that, that the answer to this, this question is, uh, um, is true. So let, let me explain sort of a heuristic justification of, of let's say, the prime conjecture. But the same argument works with on, on Yak. Um, and it, it uses what's called the Kramer random model of the primes. I get which way the accent goes. Okay. Okay. It's, it's a probabilistic model. So we will use the language of probability. Of course, the primes are not random. Okay, You don't have to roll any dice or flip any coins to, to generate the primes. But it's, it's very useful to think about the primes um, using random uh, language. So we we'll introduce some randomness artificially. So, so here's what we do. Okay, so we pick a large number x. A large number x. Um, and we'll pick uh, and we'll draw in India, and randomly, you don't call me random. <laughs> oh, I should say uh, it's the random <laughs> interval in, uh, in, in um, uh, the remote audience. Uh, should I, should just, I should check. Is there any issue with the writing? Okay, I'll take that as a note. OK. Um, all right, so uh, take an integer uh, uniformly random. So, so every number has like a one in x chance of being chosen. Um, now, let's um, think for the prime number theorem. Yeah. It's one of the basic results in analytic like, number theory proved in the uh, 1896 or 97 or something um, that the number of primes up to x is uh, it's roughly actually what's called the log integral of x. Um, okay, up to um, a low order term, so, so times one plus um, little of one. 
the little one means something that goes to zero as x goes to infinity. So asymptotically, uh, the number of primes up to x is roughly uh, this log integral, which is also actually, um, if you work it out, it's x over log x times low order terms. Okay, so um, this is uh, a famous theorem. Uh, it's proven using the Riemann zeta function, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll just take it as, 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 as given. Um, so uh, because of this theorem, uh, you can compute the probability that n is prime. So uh, if you pick a number from x to two x, uh, what this says is about x over log x of these x numbers are prime. So the probability that n is prime, basically one over log x times low order terms. So um, most numbers are not prime, only one in log x numbers are prime, um, but we have sort of, um, um, we have the probability of this event. Now, if we shift n by two, uh, if you should take a number uniformly random in x and two x, you should shift by two, that's all, that's essentially almost the same distribution. It's now uniform from between x plus two and two x plus two, but as x is locked, it's, it's almost the same thing. And so the same argument was that the probability that n plus two is prime, is also roughly one of log x. Okay, so we know the probability of these two events. Now, uh, so far everything is actually rigorous, um, but now it's a non-rigorous step. Okay, so we assume. Uh, is there a problem? Okay, uh, so we assume the events are independent. Okay. Or maybe approximately independent. So if these two events we need to be independent, then the probability that n and n plus two are both prime should be the product of these six, which is n also one plus the one log squared x. Okay. And so this tells you that the number of twin primes if you undo the, the probabilistic language, the number of twin primes that you can find inside this interval x to two x should be um, x over log squared x times low order terms. And this goes to infinity, uh, and so you have infinitely many twin primes. Okay, so um, this is um, a very simple argument. Um, the function is wrong. Now there's, there's many ways to see that it's wrong, but maybe the simplest way is that if this argument actually was valid, it would also work for n plus one. You could replace n plus two by n plus one here. And it would also um, prove that there's infinitely many consecutive primes, which uh, um, adjacent primes, which is of course um, not true. Um, and so of course, uh, the problem is this, uh, um, these points are not independent. Um, and um, if you think about the difference between n plus two and n plus one, um, the reason is that there, there is a correlation between the event n being prime and n plus two being prime because prime numbers tend to be odd. Um, and if n is odd, n plus two is also odd. So um, the parity, so, so n mod two uh, correlates these two events. But uh, maybe that's the only correlation. Okay, so uh, you, can, you can revise the model. So um, what if n plus two, so in this, in these two events, so what if they're not independent, which is false, okay. but they're what we call conditionally independent. Um, based on the parity of n mod two. So, uh, in probabilistic language, the parity of, of n gives you the sort of sub-sigma algebra um, of all the events. Okay, and relative to that sigma algebra, um, then you have independence. Um, so then you can refine this prediction. Okay, so, so, um, all right, so we, we know that n is prime with probably one of the log x, and n plus two is prime with probably one of the log x, but you can divide into odd and even cases. Say n equals one mod two. So you can split this event into odd and even cases. Okay. Of course, there are almost no even primes. There's only one. Um, in, in this interval, x to x, in fact, there's none. Okay, but certainly, um, 
let me just say that that uh, instead, of, instead of one plus big O, it's zero plus. It's up to the order terms. There's definitely no primes um, in the even event. Um, and to compensate, so, so these events occur with probably basically one half each when x is large. And so uh, to compensate, once you know that x is odd, n is odd, the probability that n is prime now jumps from one of the log x to two of the log x. Okay? Um, and the same is true uh, for n plus two. N plus two also has um, the same statistics. Okay? Note that adding by two doesn't change the parity of, of, of n. So uh, if you assume conditional independence, this means that with our new model, um, this is what we call the kramer granville uh, model. Well, this is the first case of the kramer uh, So this is kramer granville model. But you don't assume complete independence, but just uh, conditional independence. Um, yeah, up to two, okay, up to prime two. Um, then uh, the probably n and plus two are both prime, given that n is even. Now we be the product of these two probabilities, and so now it's four. four log x squared, and uh, in the odd, sorry, in the, in the even case, uh, odd case, and in the even case, you're multiplying two zeros, and so it should just be zero. Okay, up to lower terms. In fact, it is zero, there are no even twin primes, but anyway, uh, that's also important. And then you can put them back together again, because these events, both of these uh, odd and even events occur probably one half. And so now our revised prediction um, is now two um, of the log squared x. So we have updated our prediction of primes. So the number of prim twin primes up to x is no longer um, x over log squared x, which is what we had before, but twice that um, plus the lower term. Okay, so this is our new prediction, but we still predict infinitely many, many twin primes, just for a slightly different count than we did before. Okay, um, and this should be a better model because if you try the same thing with n plus one, you get a prediction of zero, uh, which is what, what you should. Um, now this model is also not correct, um, but it is less incorrect than the previous one. Um, because while it does uh, now uh, take into account one correlation between these events coming from n mod two, it doesn't um, take into account um, correlations mod three, for instance. See, if n is prime, then n will be co-prime to three. So n is either one mod three or two mod three, uh, which, makes it, um, which makes it slightly more likely than usual that n plus two will be divisible by three. So you know, ordinarily, if, if n was just random, n plus two should be divisible by three one third of the time. You know that n was already uh, not zero mod three, so it's only one, one mod three or two mod three. Then half the time it will be one mod three. So half the time n plus two will be divisible by three. So the, the probability that uh, so once you know that n is prime, that actually elevates the probability that n plus three is, uh, two is prime. Um, was it elevates or no, it decreases the uh, the uh, 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 well, it elevates it because of the mod two correlation. Uh, because if n is prime, then n is odd. N plus two is odd. That makes it likely to be prime. But also, if n is prime, n is um, not divisible by three, which makes it a bit more likely than usual that n plus two is divisible by three. Yes. So we expect the asymptotic to be about prime. If we actually count the number of twin primes, we expect it to be absolute log squared x with some constant. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, yes. I will get to that. Um, yeah. So, so we, this prediction we believe to be incorrect, and this one we believe to be incorrect. But uh, this one, is, well, um, but. Uh, uh, there's a sequence of incorrect predictions which we believe to converge to a correct prediction. <laughs> okay. um, right, so you can, um, right, so um, you can refine this, okay, so you can refine this analysis. I work not just with n more two, n more two, and n more three. Or equivalently by uh, trying to do anything, which is working n mod six, and dividing um, this interval x to two x into six epic progressions, and doing this sort of analysis in each of the six progressions separately, and assuming conditional independence with respect to this um, uh, amount of information. Uh, and in order to make that work, you need what's called the prime number theory in epic progressions. And so what that says is that if you count how many primes there are up to x, which are uh, equal to a mod q. Okay, 
then the number of primes should be roughly uh, x over log x times one over the Euler uh, quotient function of, 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 um, of, of, of Q if A and Q are co-prime uh, plus low order terms. If any fixed progression. Uh, so for example, um, if this was zero mod two, this would be a zero here. If this was two mod two, uh, you have a one here. Uh, if it were one mod three, you'd have a one half here and so forth. So uh, for example, what this is saying is that mod three, um, almost no prime is zero mod three. Half of the prime should be one mod three, half the prime should be two mod three. Right? That's sort of roughly um, what the same is saying. And, and this uh, theorem is proven by the same kind of methods used to prove the Panama theorem. The Panama theorem is, is, is based mostly on the properties of the Riemann zeta function. Um, and this result is based mostly on the properties of a broader, a more general class than the zeta function called the Dirichlet L functions. But anyway, you can um, insert this. this. This allows you to repeat this analysis. Um, and uh, you, if, you, if you then use prime two and three, uh, you can get a similar prediction, but the number two is replaced by, I think, four thirds, if you, if you, work, it out, if you work it out completely. Um, and you can keep going. So um, I've actually assigned the, cal the exact calculations and exercise. I was asked to provide some exercises for this, uh, this lecture notes. So if you actually work it out, uh, what you find is that if you, uh, so, so um, taking into account two and three would be called, would be, I would call using the kramer Granville model up to prime three. Okay, so if, if you use the kramer Granville model up to some prime, well, for, for primes, some threshold W, uh, what you find in analysis is that the num predicted number of primes, of twin primes, X should be uh, X over log squared X times a certain constant, which is twice the number of odd primes uh, less than W. Uh, I think one number. Okay, so there's a certain number which turns out to be this plus um, a lower term. Um, so um, every new prime that you throw into this model gives you a correction um, to the constant. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, you, know, you can see these, these are sort of convergent. Uh, um, you know, the, the, um, each new prime gives you a smaller and smaller correction to, to, this, uh, to this product. So you know, mod two and mod three already make a big difference, but you know, mod 17 um, makes almost no difference to, um, to this calculation. And so um, the limit of all these models is what, what is uh, conjectured to be the truth. So as a special case of what's called the highly liberal prime tuples conjecture. Um, as a special case. What we actually believe in the case is that the number of two primes to x should actually be asymptotic to x log squared x times the infinite version of product, twice uh, the product over all infinite primes, not all odd primes, sorry. And this is an explicit constant. Um, it's called the trend prime constant, and it turns out to be uh, okay. It's about three, two, or three. Um, so um, yeah, it, 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 you can show us a convergent product, um, and this everybody in Ellingham three believes this to be a true, true state. You can compute numerically how many primes twin primes are up to a trillion, and this is actually a very good. Um, a very good approximation. Actually, to be, uh, it's even better if you take a log integral here rather than an expo log squared x, but it, it is basically, um, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the numerics are quite convincing, but, we, we do, but just more generally, um, every other prediction that we, that this kind of limiting kramer Granville model gives, uh, well, with a few edge case exceptions, but, um, uh, but we still understand when it, it breaks down. Um, like, Every time it makes a prediction, either it's sort of numerically very consistent with numerics, or sometimes we can actually verify uh, with, uh, um, uh, with theory that it actually works. So we are quite confident in, um, uh, in, in, in this prediction, uh, although we can't prove it. Uh, uh, since there are, um, yeah, well, not, not, in, not in general, so, unless you make additional assumptions. 
Mr. Modi, also good enough to give the next photo. Um, yeah, so, so this heuristic, uh, that's a good question. What is the, uh, the error term? So, um, so, so first of all, as I said, uh, if you want good error terms, you should actually uh, replace this with a, a log interval. Um, and then, I, um, yeah, so there's a strong version of the Prime-Tuples conjecture where we believe actually that this, this, this error term is about the square root of the, um, of, of the main term. This is an analogy with the Riemann hypothesis. So uh, the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent in the number of primes, some, forget about twin primes, it's just primes, the number of primes of the x. Okay, uh, this should be the log integral. And the error is about um, square root size. Okay. Uh, we are nowhere near directly proving this, um, but this is what is believed. And so optimistically, uh, we would expect the same thing to also be true for twin primes and so on, but that, that would be at least as hard as the hypothesis and the Trimbach conjecture put together. Uh, so, uh, but um, um, one, one can still make this. There are random models of the primes where you can prove that this asymptotic holds almost surely for the random model, which is in some sense heuristic evidence uh, of, of this. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so that, is, that is the belief. Um, it, um, this doesn't really come from, I mean, uh, these, uh, um, I'm, I'm being very vague about exactly how bad these errors, these little old ones are. Um, and I guess as W gets somewhat large, uh, actually, uh, this kind of analysis begins to, to, to deteriorate. Um, but nevertheless, we kind of, we do expect this type of asymptotic, um, um, yeah, but, but only conjecturally. Uh, there's, uh, there's no chance of current methods that we can close to that. Question. So, analogous heuristics would give you also an approach to the Polignac's conjecture, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm using twin primes as an example, uh, but uh, the hardly the Pantubus conjecture actually uh, gives a more general, like, if, um, um, so in fact, more generally, if you take any tuple of, 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 um, of integers and you ask how many numbers n are there, such so n plus h1, numbers up to x, so n plus h1, h2, n plus hk, or prime. You can have a very similar analysis, um, and what you will find, uh, let's say they're, they're all distinct, is that, um, that uh, the, the general high negative of Pantuples conjecture predicts that the number of prime tuples like this um, should be um, a certain constant, which uh, I can't write as a, okay, it looks like that, okay, um, plus the middle of one, x over log the kx. And this is a certain constant, it's called the singular series. And it has a certain definition, which it looks a little bit like this, but more complicated. Um, it's given in the notes. Um, yeah, so, so there, there is a more, gen a more general prediction. And again, we believe, um, we have some belief about what the error term is and so forth. Um, and um, in fact, there's even more general conjectures where instead of these linear forms, you can put in polynomials. And there's also a, a conjecture. Um, um, so yeah, we, we have all these random models that uh, basically uh, we, we can predict um, how many solutions there are, like anytime you have any system of equations and, you want, and, and, and variables and you want, to, you want a certain number of variables to be prime, we have um, um, very convincing heuristics as to how many such solutions you should have in, in any large box. Um, and occasionally, we can, sometimes we can actually prove that prediction, but many times we can't. Uh, I will talk more about that particular problem. Um, uh, yeah, so in my third lecture, I'll talk about how we can get some asymptotic linear equations in primes. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't cover the trend prime case uh, on, on the results. Okay, so, ooh, all right, uh, running out of time. Okay, so we have all these good heuristics, okay, but uh, what is actually known? All right, so, so maybe uh, I will uh, skip uh, some of the things given in the notes. So um, uh, what you can do fairly easily is that, uh, so I, I said we have this, this trivial bound, uh, that, that, that the prime gap is formed by, by, by P of N. Um, if you use the prime, so this is just virtual possibility. Okay. Um, if you use the prime number theorem, uh, and this is this is true for all that. If you use the prime number theorem, you can include this to literal P of all that. This is a consequence of the prime number theorem. Um, but uh, another consequence of the prime number theorem um, and the pigeonhole principle is that you can do a lot better to some end. Uh, you can get Um, log size, okay, and this is from P and the prime number theorem plus the visual principle. Okay. 
And so this is this is um, only not not for all gaps, but, but, but for infinitely many uh, gaps, the gap is at most log size. Um, and um, I can again give you the reason um, probabilistically in probabilistic language. So again, pick number n from x to two x at random. Okay, um, and as I said, the probability of this prime basically is log x, but also n plus one, n plus two. If I take a whole bunch of shifts, um, let's say m shifts where m is uh, well, um, m is about log x. Okay. All of these events, um, they all have a probability about one log x in prime, because um, log x is much less than than the, uh, the size of this interval. So, in particular, if you choose m to be just a little bit bigger than um, log x, now this implies that if you sum this is from h equals one to m. Well, the is prime. If each of these events has a size one, one over log x, and if you have about log x of these, interval, of, of these events, once you put a, a super chosen m, you can make this the total sum of all these events have a total sum to be equal to one. And um, just from the Pichetot principle uh, for probability spaces, if you have a sequence of events whose total probability sums to more than one, then they can't all be destroyed. Two of the events must overlap. Okay, so therefore there must exist h and h prime between one and m, such that um, um, the intersection between these, these events is non-zero, which implies in particular that there's a prime gap, which is either equal to h prime minus h or less than that. Okay. So, um, of course, there could also be a prime in between these two primes. So the prime gap could actually be less than this, but this, this would certainly tell you this prime gap of size at most, the gap between h and h prime, which is, which is at most log x. Okay, which is about the same as log here. Okay, so that, that's sort of how you get um, this sort of gap. Um, so this is a, a very easy result, okay, but it's far, it's, it's far from the truth, right? We expect two, uh, but here we have log n. Um, but it took quite a long time to improve this. Um, so um, Hardy and Littlewood were the first to make some progress on this where they um, uh, they could improve the, the one to a two thirds. They needed the generalized human hypothesis to do this. Okay, so they worked very hard using uh, using extremely powerful conjectures. Um, but then uh, people refined the methods and, and um, uh, slowly reduced this constant. Um, and then the, uh, in the uh, uh, early 2000s, there was a breakthrough Finally, uh, to get um, to actually not just improve the concept, but actually get literal log n. Uh, this was the famous result of Ghost and Pinson Yoder. This is what we call the GPY sieve. Um, and then uh, there was a very, uh, even more famous, maybe, breakthrough of Zhang, where they finally, he finally got boundary gaps, and, and, and the bounty got was 7 million. Uh, Zhang in 2014. The author. Okay, so this is, well, it's still not, not two, but, uh, but it doesn't grow anymore. Um, and then this number got improved um, by, by, by many um, uh, people. Uh, yeah, so uh, shortly afterwards, in particular, there was um, a very nice paper of Maynard introducing what we now call the Maynard sieve, um, uh, 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 or Maynard Tower, actually, but I also uh, never discovered a, a very different bit. Uh, um, yeah, he got it down to, to, to 600, and uh, the current record right now is actually 2.6, uh, and this is uh, an, an online collaboration of Plan Map 8, involving many people, including Maynard and myself, who uh, worked to optimize all these results. And, this, um, and so this is true, uh, so these are all like, infinitely often. Um, and this is still uh, the best record, this is called 2015. So, so okay, this, this is the, uh, the best result known uh, for now. Um, so let me sort of, uh, so I can't give the full proof here, certainly not, and I only have half an hour remaining at most. Um, but um, the general strategy is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's basically, it's the same pigeonhole principle argument. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so we, we have this argument here, and the moment we can get certain properties bigger than one, uh, we can invoke the original principle and, and get um, and get a result. Um, but uh, uh, the, the problem is that each of these events has very low probability. Okay, so, 
So we're, we're drawing n uniformly random, n is very unlikely to be prime. Only one in log h comes to be prime, n plus one is also very unlikely to be prime. And so you need to put a lot of these images together to, to add up to one. And this is why the gap, the bound of the prime gap is pretty bad. It's like log x. Um, but the thing about the Pigeon principle is that it doesn't care what probability space you work in. And you know, um, the basic idea is to not pick, you, you pick a number n between x and 2x, but you don't pick it uniformly. Um, but you pick it in a more clever way so that you, uh, you can um, increase the probabilities here. So the basic idea, find a non-uniform uh, probability distribution. Correct. That if, if n is drawn this distribution, probably that n um, some shift of n is prime for some um, well chosen tu tuple. Okay, so uh, for some um, HK, so such, such that these, these probably are large. Uh, in, in particular, what you want is that you want the probability that um, all these probabilities sub, um, um, so large that if, if you add together all these probabilities, they're bigger than one. And then you can run the same kind of, um, of argument as before. Um, and you want, okay, if you can get this, uh, what this, this will tell you is that the prime gap is, will be less than the width of this tuple. Okay, so the same sort of original argument that I gave will give a bound which is um, um, coming from the, the length of this tuple. So basically, you want to use uh, you want to get as small a tuple as possible um, in order for, for this to work. So, so if you use the uniform distribution, you can use um, you can you can use a tuple consisting of, of consecutive numbers of size about log x. So it gives you a, a log x type bound. But um, if you can work with a, 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 a smaller tuple, then this. Uh, you do better. So for example, the 246 result, there's actually an explicit tuple of 50 numbers of diameter 246, for which we can actually get this to work. All right, so it's, it's a, the question is how do you actually find um, a probability distribution which is, um, uh, which is now non-uniform, but for which you can still compute these probabilities. So, so for the uniform distribution, you can just use the prime number theorem. Okay. But now you need some sort of weighted prime number theorem, uh, weighted by whatever weight uh, this distribution is, and you want to still be able to compute these probabilities to make these large. Okay, so um, all right. So just to simplify things, um, I will just so you have you have to pick a good tuple. Um, I, to, just to illustrate the ideas, I will I will talk about the I will use the um, the prime the twin prime tuple zero two, which doesn't work uh, actually. I mean, we, we we can't actually make a strategy work with just zero and two. That would give us a twin prime projection. We have to work with bigger tuples. But just for sake of uh, saving talk, um, I will talk about just uh, zero and two. Okay, so so um, to simplify. This, okay. How to find um, two x? <laughs> that the probability of n being prime and the probability of n plus two being prime is large. So if you if you pick uniformly, you get like one of a log x. Um, if you pick maybe n being odd, you can make them both two of a log x. Okay, but that's still pretty small. Right? Can you make it even? Um, okay. And ideally, uh, so large that the sum of these two is bigger than one. Okay, then that would give us a true man projection. All right. Um, now, uh, if we knew the highly little with prime tuple conjecture, which we don't, uh, there is an obvious distribution that works here. Okay, you could pick. Um, so one answer is that you pick n distribution. You just pick n as a twin prime between x and two x. So you 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 pick n to using the distribution with n and n plus two over prime, and in, in, in x plus two. So you restrict n for this interval, you restrict n to n plus two to both the prime, and then you have to normalize by um, whatever is needed to make this a, a, a distribution. So if you pick uniformly among all the twin primes, two x, then um, just by, by definition, n is going to be prime in probability one, and n plus two is going to be prime in probability one. And one plus one is bigger than one. Okay, so you would prove the trim prime conjecture. Okay. But in order for this probability distribution to, to make sense, uh, you need uh, um, you need this this constraint to be non-empty. You need at least one 
um, number in this set to begin with. And um, you need something like the Trinkine conjecture to get that. Uh, so um, all I had, uh, all I had you know, demonstrate with, with, with this choice is that the Trinkine conjecture implies the Trinkine conjecture. <laughs> um, right, but um, so that's sort of the ideal choice. Okay, and conjecturally it works. Um, but the thing is, we can't actually compute these probabilities because we, we, are, well, there's not even, we can't even ensure this quantify because we, we could be dividing by zero. Okay. But uh, that, that gives us the hint of what we should be doing. Um, <coughs> so that, that doesn't work because we, it requires us to understand the primes. But uh, sort of what does work, roughly speaking, okay, so, so attempt number two is that uh, you again restrict n to x to x, okay, and you make n plus two not prime but almost prime. Now, what almost prime means sort of um, so prime means not divisible by, by any number smaller than itself, um, but maybe not divisible by any prime, let's say up to x to the delta uh, for some delta, for some delta at a small constant. Uh, if, if you get the order to do one half, then the separate autosceles is that once you're not divisible by any prime less than x one half, or maybe two x one half, um, then you actually prime. Okay, but uh, we're going to relax that and say maybe we, you know, we only want primes uh, to exclude primes up to um, um, some smaller threshold like x zero point zero one. Okay, so this is a larger set. Okay, so, so um, this creates what we call almost primes. Okay, I guess almost primes at the level of x to the delta, so it's called the rough numbers, x to the delta rough numbers. Um, so uh, they are a bit more, um, they are a slightly larger set than the primes themselves, but the, 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 they're larger by um, a constant factor that depends on this delta, which you can work out and do it here. Um, and so um, morally speaking, uh, if, you, uh, if you choose this, then uh, the probably n is prime, and in, in plus two is prime, is not, not like a one, but it's still pretty large. So, um, Okay, so this type of, of expression you can actually, well, yeah. So, so either this or some approximation or some approximation. Uh, it turns out that this particular, like this exact uh, cutoff is actually not quite uh, optimal. And this, there's a slightly smoother weighting. There are many other twists of weighting here that actually are slightly better. Um, but anyway, these kind of weights are called sieve weights. And there was a whole, um, there's an entire sub branch of another theory called SIP theory, which is basically devoted to understanding what happens. Like, uh, like if you take these, these probability distributions, how do you calculate um, things like probably n is prime and so forth? That, that, uh, yes? Uh, for our audience in the KF, could you uh, write a bit bigger? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. I feel like they can see very well. Um, okay. Uh, I'll try my best. Right, so in a sense, this is an extension of the kramer bandle type philosophy, philosophy. I said already that like, if you restrict n plus two to both be odd, this already kind of improves uh, the probability of n and n plus two being prime. And then if you also restrict n plus two to both be odd and co prime to three, um, it, that, that also again increases uh, the chance that these guys are prime. Uh, and basically uh, uh, it is possible to kind of uh, uh, extrapolate uh, this sort of, uh, Easy computations mod two and mod three, and and get uh, and you can sieve up to uh, moduli about x x to a certain power. Um, for small moduli, you can get by using um, kind of just inclusion exclusion principle. Like you know, if you want to count how many numbers there are which are co-prime to two and three, you can use um, inclusion exclusion. You can remove the numbers that are co-prime divisible by two, and then remove the numbers divisible by three, and then you add back the numbers that are divisible by two and three. Uh, and so this 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 you get like three different terms or four different terms. Uh, and you can work up everything. Uh, if you try the same thing for primes up to like x to the delta, you apply complete inclusion exclusion. You get like two to the x to the delta type terms, and then you have too many terms. Um, so many that the error terms get bigger than the main terms, and you don't actually get a good estimate. But SIP theory has got all these tricks to, to deal with this. There are these various truncations of the inclusion exclusion formula that are not quite exact, um, but they have many fewer terms and still give pretty good bounds. Uh, you may have heard of the Bonferroni inequalities. That's, 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 that's one tool that's, that's used. And then there's many more advanced things like that. But anyway, um, it is possible to, um, uh, to make this argument um, um, 
uh, you can, so using the source strategy. Fine. Um, 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 uh, non uniform distributions. Such that, uh, for example, if you're doing um, k tuples, the, the product of h i is prime, you can make each probability like a small constant over k. Well, C is something like, like 0.1. Um, so on the one hand, this is a lot better than the uniform distribution because uniform distribution gives you like one over log x, right? Because it's zero. So now you, you can get um, um, probabilities that, that are constant in, in x, but unfortunately they still decay in k. Uh, and in particular, um, they fall short of this condition. If you sum them, uh, you can get something the size of 0.1, but not actually one. Um, so this is kind of what standard sieves, these, these are kind of like textbook sieves. For example, there was a recent textbook by Ivan H and uh, 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 Friedlander um, on, uh, on sieves theory. And he just he just sort of used the standard sieves even and optimize everything. You get something like this. Um, the um, the uh, the breakthrough of Goldson, Pence, and Yodo was that they in introduced a sieve which was able to get instead of constant over k, they, they can get one over I say one minus a small constant. Um, uh, over k um, by a very delicate um, choice of sieve, which uh, I think it's in the notes, but I will not write exactly what it is. Um, and so they got very, very close to um, uh, to getting the threshold. Because when you sum this up, uh, they get uh, they, they almost get they get one minus a little bit. They didn't quite get one. Um, Probability of m plus h pi is prime. Yes. Uh, so this is for every i. Yeah, from I from one to k. Yeah, so you you you, you pick a k tuple. Uh, it has to obey a condition called admissibility. Okay, you can't quite pick any k tuple, but but uh, let me ignore that for now. But if you pick a suitable k tuple, uh, you can make you can find a distribution that depends on that k tuple, so that uh, these k events all occur with probably some small constant. Um, okay, so um, this analysis relied on a certain um, a uh, result called the Bombay Vinegar theorem. Uh, and um, I don't have time to explain exactly what this theorem is, but it, it, it roughly speaking is an advanced version of the prime number theorem in mathematical progression. So I, it, I talked about finding primes in mathematical progressions. Okay. And there's a certain main term and a certain error term. Um, and um, the standard um, prime number theorem in ethnic progressions uh, is only good for small moduli. So there's, there's, um, there's a version of the prime number theorem in ethnic progressions called the siegel wolfers theorem, which gives you a good bound for the prime number theorem in ethnic progressions, but only for small q, q only for size about log, um, log like size. You can get some very good bounds. Um, but if you want to use these, um, this sieve up to this level x to the delta, you want to be able to, um, to handle larger moduli. And the bombay vernikov theorem allows you to get um, good estimates on the number theorem, um, not for all q, but for almost all q, up to x to the one half minus an epsilon. You, you can get, um, uh, so for progressions of spacing as sparse as, as, as square root of, of x, um, Bombay and Verigrado had a very nice argument that let you control almost all progressions like this. Um, and this was a key input in, in this g analysis. Um, and uh, Goldstein, Pinson, and Yodorum observed that if, if there was ever any way to improve this um, Bombay and Verigrado theorem, that if instead of going up to just below x one half, if they could ever get a similar panorama theorem for x, q, um, x plus one half um, epsilon, then they could actually um, add an epsilon to this. Um, to this estimate here, and they could finally make this, uh, this strategy work. So, um, so um, there was a lot of interest in trying to, to improve the range of the bombay vinogradov theorem. And Yitang Zhang's big contribution was that he was able 
to actually make a small improvement to this Bombay Renegado theorem by a very difficult argument, uh, but only for, um, not for all Q, but for a, a very restricted type of Q code. Um, um, if the modulator was, was called very smooth, so no large prime factors, only very small prime factors. But Yi Shang Zhang was able to, refine, to get a tiny push um, to this Bombay Renegado theorem. And so that's how he was able to get um, a, um, um, a slight improvement that, that gave um, Banagat primes. Um, but then uh, later, Maynard showed that you didn't need any of that. Um, and he found um, a better way to sieve um, than the DPY sieve, uh, a slightly different form than and the details are in the notes, uh, but he could pick a different distribution where even just using the usual bombay vinegar theorem, not using this fancy um, improvement of Zhang, uh, he could get uh, a situation where all these probabilities are, in fact, not, um, um, not just like one over k or the epsilon k, but actually a uh, log k over k. Um, and so um, you could actually gain not just a, a, a um, so um, you could actually gain a, a tiny improvement here. Um, and so, so one consequence of this actually is that not only was he able to show, um, so as I said before, analysis was able to show many prime gaps are bounded, but actually um, the same analysis now for the first time you could actually get um, clusters of primes. So not only could you control consecutive primes, but actually k tuples of primes, obviously m tuples of primes. Uh, he got a bound, I think something like m cubed e to the 4m. That, um, but if you want, say, 10 primes close to each other, you could also find clusters of primes that, 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 uh, that were some bounded distance apart, which uh, Zhang's method and GPY's method was not able to do. Um, and there have been many other consequences since um, of, of, uh, of the main sieve, um, which uh, unfortunately I don't have time to discuss. But maybe I'll close by discussing the parity problem. Um, so why can't these methods actually get the, the true prime conjecture? So um, the simplest way to think about it is that you can divide the natural numbers into two classes. Um, one is the numbers n with an odd number of prime factors. Uh, kind of multiple set. And numbers of an even number of prime factors. Um, there's something called the Louisville function, which we'll hear about in, in other lectures. Um, double the numbers of the Louisville function minus one. It's possible. Um, so it, it turns out that that um, these um, this this function is kind of equally uh, it behaves like like a random sign pattern and we had in fact explicit conjectures that 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 that, 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 that formalize this that um, if you pick n uniformly from x to two x um, this is version of the polynomial theorem that says that that, that this Lua function is just as likely to be minus one as it is plus one so uh, uniformly random the probability that n has an odd number of prime factors. is one half of the lower terms, and it's the same for E. So um, numbers are just, just as likely to be even an odd number of prime factors. This is a, a variant, this is a consequence of a number theory. Um, and then there's also a similar thing um, if you, uh, for ethnic progressions, if you restrict n to a single resting class A mod Q, let's say the numbers are say one mod seven or something, then also um, the prime number theorem in ethnic progressions actually tells you that half inside that residue class, half of the numbers will have an odd number of prime factors, half the numbers will have prime factors. And conjecturally, even if you have a very sparse ethnic progression, um, you should still have this kind of asymptotic and with very good error terms. Error terms are conjectured to be like, like spare root um, of, of, of the main term that we have. We have. Um, this type of equidistribution is ex ex extremely robust. And because, or conjecturally, and because of that equidistribution, uh, any kind of non-uniform distribution that comes from civic, like inclusion, exclusion, you know, taking out models of two, putting back in models of six and so forth, is expected to be um, uh, behave similarly. So, so we expect a similar behavior. Any non-uniform distribution.
Sister. Okay, so like if you sieve so like n and n plus two are both almost prime, um, it should still be the case that within that sieve, half the numbers should have an odd number of prime factors, and half of them should have even number of prime factors. We should not be able to um, to bias the Luber function in, in, in any way using sieves. A little bit just kind of orthogonal to, to every single sieve theory construction that, that we know how to control. Um, so as a consequence, um, all of these probabilities can never exceed one half. Because if you ask for example, the probability that n is prime, that's a sub-event of the probability that, of probably that n has an odd number of prime factors. And that's expected to occur probably one half. Um, so, so basically, sieve theory cannot distinguish the parity of the number of prime factors of a number. Um, and this is what's called the parity problem. This is an inherent limitation of sieve theory. And so, um, yeah, the most you can ever hope to get, well, probably that n is prime or n plus two is prime is at most one half. And this is why we cannot get the sum to be larger than one. Um, if you had uh, if you had only two, like n n plus two, if you had say n n plus two and n plus six, if you had three events. Um, the parity um, obstruction tells you that that no individual event can occur with probably bigger than one half. But now it is possible to um, to get uh, things bigger than, um, than uh, to things to get to some bigger than one. So, for example, there is a conditional result. Uh, so, this polymath paper I referred to earlier, uh, we also know we can get the gap between twin primes, uh, between the adjacent primes, down to six infinitely often, uh, assuming um, a conjecture, assuming um, a strong version of the Bombay Venegrado theorem called the Elliott Hapsan conjecture. Technically, yeah, technically the generalized uh, Elliott Hapsan conjecture, let me not talk about what uh, that means. Uh, which is a statement that this Bombay Venegrado theorem that I mentioned is true not just up to one half or one half as epsilon, in fact, all the way up to one. Um, that uh, it's conjectured that we have really good error bounds for primes in affect progression for almost all Q up to x1 minus epsilon. Uh, this is called the Elliott Halberstam conjecture. This is out of reach. This is kind of the Riemann hypothesis of sieve theory. Uh, it would be great if we had it, um, but it, it gives you quite good results. But, but even with this Elliott Halberstam conjecture, the parity problem is still present, and we, we cannot get two by these methods. Um, this is, um, and actually, you also can't get four. Uh, six is the best you can do for. There's a stupid mod three obstruction that, that lets you stop you from getting uh, less than six. Um, but th this is sort of the best possible endpoint of SIF theory um, methods towards the, the trim time conjecture. If you want to actually prove the trim time conjecture, you need something which is not SIF theory, and we don't know what that is. Uh, but maybe that's a good good place to stop. Thanks,